because I would like to reiterate my thanks to the organizers, Don Yop and Shintaro, for so well organized workshop, which is so smoothly running and everything is fine, and I enjoy it very much. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, today. So last time I tried mostly to concentrate on the complex structure on the moment angle manifolds corresponding to simple polytopes. Which that subject is particularly new for me, and I uh, find it uh, quite interesting uh, to study the complex geometry of those manifolds. Manifold. But for you, or at least for some of you, those manifolds might be quite new, and I probably still didn't give enough motivation uh, last time for the study at all. So why should you study those manifolds? And in particular, why should you study their complex geometry? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Today, at least in the first lecture, I'll try to give some more motivation to put those moment angle manifolds in a more general framework, and I'll try to convince you that they really appear in so many disguises in so many other subjects, so that I believe that to study them is quite important. Mm. They're quite interesting and they're all. So, I remember, because the last time is that I had put it up, given by M linear equations. And we assumed something about that set of linear equations. In particular, we assumed that, that P is M dimensional, simple polytop. The definition of simple already appeared in many talks, so I wouldn't repeat that. Like one possible way to define a general position for the top. Um, and so that there are facets which is obtained by turning that inequality into equation and intersecting the corresponding hyperplane with the polytope. And well last time for the complex structure it was important to allow that uh, to allow some of those inequalities to be actually redundant. But for today's lecture that you can actually go without that. So actually, you can assume that there are exactly uh, no redundancies, no redundant inequalities. So let's assume that for today, that would be easier to treat. I mean, we can easily adapt the arguments uh, to allow us also that redundant inequalities. That's not a problem. That was important for complex structure, but that's not very important to, to other things. So then we had a map from Rm to Rm, so Rm to Rm, which sends x to that, like, just the set of values of those left-hand sides. Which we wrote in a matrix form like that. So AP is a matrix that's M times N matrix, and that's M times 1 column. And X is just X M times 1 column of coordinates. So that's an affine map, affine embedding. And from that map, we constructed an R manifold, which we call moment angle manifolds, like, like that. So if you restrict that, uh, that map on, on your P, then actually end up in the positive cone, the set subset here with non-negative coordinates. And now you look at it as an image of the standard moment map, of just the coordinate projection for the coordinate-wise action of the torus. And then you pull back or restrict on the image of IP and get some manifold, which can be written as Mm, by quadratic uh, by quadratic equations, uh, and the choice of the quadratic equations is equivalent to the choice of a matrix C, CJK, so that CAP. So you choose a matrix of full rank, satisfying that matrix quality. Then we can write ZP and the intersection of vortex. That. Okay. And 
we call that the moment angle manifold. Corresponding to P. Okay, that was a reminder. <coughs> and now let's briefly go over the other constructions of the same manifold. Uh, you'll see that it actually there are many different constructions. It was actually the last of them historically. At least for us, other people actually started by, as I said last time, other people started by considering manifolds defined by those quadratic equations, and after that they realized that they're the same as what was by that time known as moment angle manifolds. So the original construction is, as I said last time, due to Davis and Yanushkevich. dimensional torus, this one, uh, the, the one that acts on CM, we write it like a mm, subset in a, in a complex space, like that, basically standard way. Right? Um, the product of circles, and also we we want to write it down as a product of circles explicitly and um, let's just denote the coordinate subcircles by T1 through Tm, right? That's the coordinate subcircles in that torus. Mm. We'll refer to them as coordinate circles or subcircles. Okay, those, we'll use them later. But now we can, by looking actually at that map, we can write down a CM as the following identification space. We can write it down as the product of that positive cone with the torus, but then you have to make some identification, um, namely you identify yt with ys whenever T as inverse belongs to the product of those so why is the point in that in Rm greater than or equal to so the set of M numbers with non negative coordinates and T is a, and S are points in the torus. You don't identify pairs with different Ys, right? You only identify pairs with different T coordinates. <coughs> and you identify them and uh, the, those things you identify depend on, depends on y, depends on how many zero coordinates you have in y. So, uh, namely, let me write that explicitly because it's important. You take the product of those coordinate circles for which the corresponding coordinate in y vanishes. And then you identify the if, if if those two belong to the same coset class with respect to that subgroup, then you identify the corresponding pairs. So that means that actually T S inverse is T1 through T M is a point such that T I equals one if Y I is not zero. Right? That's the same. So if it's not zero, then you don't have the corresponding subcircle here, so just one of the corresponding. And if it's zero, then there is a freedom. You can choose arbitrary uh, so coordinate within that coordinate circle, right? So well, in particular, well, if m equals one, then you just write c as a product of the that ray, that's just r one with the circle, so that's like you have a cylinder, uh, uh, like infinite half cylinder, and then you identify the identity. identification happens only over zero, right? And you just squeeze that circle into a point. So that's how that... Huh? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're right, you're right. But I just brought it that way, yeah, so. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you're right. Like that. And that you just squeeze that thing. So uh, it's, it's only topological picture, I mean, that they did. So it's, you got something like corn, yeah, not spotted. Um, that's that's you how you think of C1. Okay, anyway, now why, why, why I wrote that so detailedly? Because, um, I, I already that one. Because now I want to restrict that I did, now I want to plug this here. So you get something like RM times TM. You can project onto the set, onto the first coordinate, and that's that's exactly that map. And then you can restrict that projection onto the P like you did here. And if you think, look on the diagram, then you actually understand that you get something like, well, that's that's basically straightforward. Then you get also side identification like that. <coughs> identification space like that. So in fact, uh, so that uh, uh, as a, we can write actually, so it follows that we can write that P as uh, P cross TM modulo the equivalence relation. And what is the equivalence relation? It's a restriction of that equivalence relation to the point of the polytope, right? But then, uh, so you can write YT equivalent to ys if, uh, if ts inverse belongs to, we'll just write that in a slightly different way, because now we are, now y is in the polytope, right, in the image of the polytope, and what does it mean that the, some coordinate of that y vanishes, right? That means that the corresponding point in the polytope belong to the corresponding facet, right? Because exactly here you have that map is like that, that coordinate vanishes whenever the points fits into the facet, right? So instead of writing Z, in general, for the polytope case, we can write that actually that means that um, I, that Y, belongs to Fi, okay? So that is, in other words, again, right, TS inverse equals T1 through TM with ti equal zero if i uh, sorry if y is not in fi okay that's 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 how your identification goes and that was exactly what davis and yanushkevich did they considered that identification space that's davis yanushkevich's construction and we actually use that and that that was the original notation as well as that be right mm. So in particular, you notice that there are no, no identifications, no identifications over the interior of P. Over the interior of P, no, no coordinates vanish, right? So there are no identifications. So that, that, that group would be unit group. There are no identifications, so which means that the TM action on the P is free over the interior of P, right? And as a corollary, as a corollary to the Davis Yanushkevich construction, we get that, that that what I mentioned last time, that actually that topological type, homomorphism type of even equivariant type, you can think of that P depends only only on the combinatorics of P. Okay, because once you identify that space with that identification space, <coughs> mm, you can actually observe that that identification is depends only on the combinatorial structure of facets, right? Depends on how that facets intersect. So that's basically very easily, and for cheap you get that statement, which if you just look at that construction, it's not very clear, right? Mm. 
now. But between that, before we understood that two, that the two are the same, actually, it took us some time, about 10 years, maybe, maybe even more. Um, and first we went, we went the other direction from the Davis Yanushkevich, and that was actually what Victor Bush Tiber originally called the moment angle complex. That's a generalization with that moment angle manifold. Um, yes, 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 yes. That's we assumed from the beginning. So it's full dimensional bullet of yes. Actually, here you don't have to assume that there are no, no redundant inequalities. You can do that with redundant inequalities. So again, you can observe that if there ever redundant inequality splits up a circle from the, from that identification space. So in particular, if yeah, if you have k redundant inequalities, then that would be like something cross k torus. Okay. Now. So uh, the first thing, so now we want to generalize that to, to objects more general than polytopes, right? Actually, since there is, no, oh, there is no geometry basically in that construction, also there was geometry in that construction, but there is no geometry in this construction, only combinatorics. But from the combinatorial point of view, polytopes are quite restricted objects, right? You can look at the, so basically polytopes are special, combinatorial polytopes are special partially ordered sets. And you, you can look at this partially ordered set with the same properties, and you get the much more of them as just polytopes. But in particular, uh, you get a partially ordered set with very similar properties if you look at the like simplicial complexes. But then you have to reverse the inclusion relation so that you keep with a sim simple polytope. So that, that's what we are trying to do. So now, to do that, you have to, uh, to understand the yet another construction of that moment angle complex. So in fact, you have the following cubical decomposition of P. So we decompose P into the union of cubes. So I'll just draw the picture, and that for many of you, I think that, that would, be <laughs> would be enough. But I will give more details to write to make it really strict, right? So that's your P, like a pentagon, right? That's uh, general, just some polytope. And you put one extra vertex inside to the, well, basically. You have to be careful, slightly careful with the geometry here, but combinatorially just put like, like a barycenter, a point inside every, inside the interior of every face. Extra point. And that would be the vertices of your cubical decomposition. And then somehow you split the, the whole pentagon into five squares, combinatorial squares, quadrilateral. And well, if by thinking a bit, you can understand that you can generalize it to, ab to arbitrary dimension. Like if, what is crucial here is that the polytope is simple, right? So for example, you can split, if you do that with a cube, with a three-dimensional cube, then you just split the cube into eight smaller cubes, right? Like this, by cutting every fast by making two, 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 two hyperplane cuts, right, like that. And in, the, in a similar way, you can do with tetrahedron, for example, and cut tetrahedron into four cubes and so on. It's like, and, uh, well, that can be made uh, piecewise linear and basically more, but I would not give the detail there, basically straightforward. So you have that that's, that's V is a vertex and CV is a cube corresponding, is a maximal dimensional cube and dimensional cube corresponding to the vertex. So you split your polytope, you represent it as a union of n-dimensional cubes and there are as many n-dimensional cubes as the vertices of the polytope. So you have one n-dimensional cube C for each vertex. Okay, so now let's restrict that there is Yanushkevich construction to that cubical decomposition. So if we have, if we, now every vertex is an, in, since your polytope is simple, every vertex is an intersection of an n tuple of facets. So then let's, let's see what happens if we restrict that to just that cube. So let's denote that B sub B is 
by definition, CV times CM modulus identification relation, right? Mm -hmm. So now, uh, how can you write that? So you have CV times. Now that, now that CV somehow deals only with those facets which contain the vertex V. So actually, all other circles split. And do not and the identification relation do not affect them. So we can write that as like that. So we first write those circles corresponding to those facets. Okay, that would be n-dimensional torus, and then we write the rest. Okay. Okay. Let's let's write J. And your identification relation only affects that torus, but it doesn't affect this one. So, and what it does with what it does with this one, okay, it's just the product of the cube with a, with, a, with a torus of the same dimension, right? And it's again similar to that construction. So that you just restrict here, let's just say your R2, and then you restrict that to the cube, and what you get actually is a polydisc, is a disc. In, in, instead of CM, if you do that with a unit cube, you get just d2 to the m, the unit disk, unit m disk. If you plug in here the cube inside, so you have kind of have some d2 m equals um, i m, the unit cube times t m modulus identification relation, right? Same. Or you can do it here even. If you put here the, 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 the instead of the r m, the, 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 that core, you, you put the unit cube and you lift that CM, then you get a unit poly disk. Okay, so that tells you that here from that you get just the unit disk, uh, unit poly disk of dimension n now because this is n dimensional, this is n dimensional, and the rest is just the torus of dimension m minus n. Okay, and that everything sits somehow inside. The big poly disk of n m dimension. So that's uh, that's unit m disk in CM. Okay, that's d two to the m our notation. Okay, so so we may write now uh, that p is a union of those b sub v is a union of be a vertex, union of vertices, right? Or those B sub Bs which sit inside the unit cube where uh, now more precisely we can write every B, B sub B as, as follows. So up to that there was kind of motivation. <laughs> then you can look at that as a, as a, as a separate definition. The same, very same space. Okay, so let's just draw the, the same product of n, n disks and m minus n circles that way. So I mean that thing means that the other uh, the other coordinates for other for other i you have just that i less than or equal to one. You either have that you always have that inequality because you are in the unit disk, but sometimes you can you have more than that. Sometimes you just have module equal one. For those coordinates which for which V is not in Fi, right, in the corresponding facet. Or if you write that vertex V as we did here, that means that I is not in that set of indices, right? So that, that, that subset in the unit disk is homeomorphic to the product of n disks and m minus n circles. Right, okay, so that's something wrong. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Like that, yeah. <laughs> yes. 
yes, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, like here. So we want to separate those circles. Right, so maybe better maybe put J here, right, so to be compatible with that notation. Okay. Now, how to generalize that? Okay. Uh, I think what I can raise. Uh, perhaps I <coughs> now let P star. geometrical presentation you can think about that combinatorially by just looking as it's as a phase faucet of P and reversing the inclusion relation so that facets becomes vertices so on that, that, that will become a simplicial but that I wrote that formula to say that that combinatorial duality has a geometrical meaning it can be write down as an explicit polytope it's a simplicial and polytope and dimensional polytope with M vertices. Those M vertices correspond to M facets of P. Okay. So let's look at its boundary. Let's, let's denote its boundary by K sub P. So this K sub P is a simplicial not no longer a polytope, it's just a simplicial complex, but very special one. In particular, it's a triangulation or a simplicial subdivision of an n minus one dimensional sphere, right? And that simplicial complex, well, we, we look at it combinatorially, so that has m vertices, and we just look at it as a simplicial complex on the set of m vertices, and we not so vertices by just we num well, we numerate them but they correspond to facets yeah that so how implicitly I always assume that our facets are numbered like indexed like you have an enumeration of facets like you know what's the first one what's the second one and now that comes so those we just uh, use the following notation that we look at that the, 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 the boundary of the dual polytope is just a simplicial complex on on the vertex set of M indices. Right, those indices are vertices. So well, like if you started, if your p was a cube, that was your p, then you go to that k p would be the boundary of the octahedron. The boundary of the octahedron. Okay, the boundary, not no, not without interior. That's k p. And so you have eight, oh sorry, six vertices, like you number them arbitrarily, like one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. So you have a simplicial complex, two-dimensional now simplicial. From a three-dimensional polytope, you get a two-dimensional simplicial complex on on six vertices, in, in this case, on six vertices. Right. So then we can write that, that one. As follows, you can write Zp equals to union over sigma in Kp. Now, now instead of looking at the 
Yeah, by the way, you could you could have written here a similar decomposition with with those blocks be corresponding to all faces, not just vertices. They'll just embed. They will not affect the whole union. They'll be smaller somehow. So I'll just so instead of that you can write down that with a synthesis of the dual complex like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it, uh, I mean, yeah. uh, in, in that case, yeah, yeah. I, I'll say that, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I'll say that in a second. Uh, so, where that is the point, it's a similar describe. So here, so what, what that means? Sigma is in KP. So here sigma, sigma is like a subset of y1 through yk. It's subset in that index set, right? And sometimes that subset happens to be a simplex in your simplicial complex, right? That's the abstract terminology. So for example, here, if your sigma is 1, 3, 5, that facet, then that belongs to KP. The KP is a collection of, of sets, of subsets, right? The abstract simplicial complex of that. That's an example. That's just to settle the notation, right? As that's a sequence. Okay. So, and then you can see that that condition, that I is not in sigma, if sigma if sigma is now the maximal simplex, then the one corresponding to the vertex of, so for example, that vertex, oh sorry, mm -hmm. well, um, that vertex, say, it went to that face, right, by duality. Mm -hmm. So, if your sigma is that face corresponding to that vertex, then that b sub sigma is exactly this b sub b. That, that condition exactly is this one, right? Well, oh, we can write j. Okay. Right. So now, but I so if so, you get exactly the same. The same. Uh, this is the same. Is the same. Decomposition as that p equals the union of p sub v. If we take, if we take only maximum as as G pointed out here. Uh, so n minus one dimensional synthesis. Sigma. Right. So if you look at only at maximal synthesis, then you get exactly the same decomposition as this one. But you don't have to take maximal ones. I mean you can take all of them and that would not affect the decomposition in that case. But to generalize that, so now we want the, the, the last step would be to generalize that to arbitrary k. So now, now, if k is arbitrary, arbitrary simplicial complex complex on M, not necessarily of that form. For example, it may be not a sphere triangulation, right? <coughs> then we can define that k in exactly, that is exactly the same way as the union of sigma with k of b sub sigma, right? That's it. <laughs> so. Okay, so that's that thing. That union is taken not just abstractly, but in the in the polities, right? Like here between the unit. So this is called the moment angle complex. Corresponding to 
P, right? Okay, so <coughs> if K was like that, K, K was KP, then we get yet another construction for that space, for that manifold. Um, but let's do a couple of simple examples. Let's do, get a feel of what's going on. So example, like we, 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 we deal with two extreme examples in a sense. The first is K equals the <coughs> boundary of M minus one dimensional simplex or let's say n dimensional simplex. Okay? That dual to P equals the n dimensional. So if you take when P is an n-dimensional simplex, then its dual is again an n-dimensional simplex, and its boundary is that. And so in that case, if M equals M plus 1, so you can write, instead of N, you can write N, M minus 1, as I originally did. And then we have ZK equals to that. If you look at that definition, what you get actually is Again, you, can, you, you only have to take the maximal simplices, right? And the maximal simplices here are like, uh, so that's, that's uh, on uh, 1, 2, and so on, n plus 1, on that set. That's a simplicial complex on that set. And the maximal simplices would be those obtained by throwing away one element. So that's, that corresponds that uh, you take a poly disk, and at one point, you replace the disk factor by a circle factor. <coughs> so that last one, we replaced by the circle. And there are n plus 1 factors here all together. And then you move that circle along those factors. So you can insert it everywhere. Okay, And then take the union. Right? And what you get is... That's the boundary of the whole disk, right? And so it's homeomorphic to S to M plus one. Like last time we did that example with the original construction also for the for the simplex, right? P equals delta F. And we saw that that was a sphere. And here also it's a sphere. It's no surprise. And the second example is when actually K is K is now not of that form. That k is of that form, but now let's take some k which is not of that form. In particular, we can take just m discrete points, disjoint points. Okay. So by the way, uh, if if the dimension of k was n minus one, I put n minus one to be compatible with that because our p was n dimensional, so kp is n minus one dimensional here also. Then uh, the dimension of that k is m plus m, right? So here we got m n plus one plus n, so it's m two n plus one. And here we got n. So the dimension of that one is is zero, right? So that means that n equals one. So what we get now is here. I mean the simplices are only one element subsets. So that, that B sigma would be like a product of all circles and only one disk. And then again, that disk you can insert at every position. Insert at every position. So you get something like that, but with D2 and S1 interchanged. It's like I will write it in a slightly different manner. Actually, much more difficult to understand what is this topologically. You can try. Even <laughs> m equals 3 is an interesting case. I'll give you an answer probably after the break. <laughs> <laughs> this is a quiz. <laughs> m equals 3 is, well, uh, so that's, that's some m plus 1 dimensional space. m plus 1 dimensional space. 
Okay. Well, so far we, we can't say more about that. That's just some sub subspace in a disk. Okay. Well, what we can we can say more about the uh, about the different situation when actually k is a sphere triangulation. That means a geometric realization. Well, but in that talk I, I somehow uh, do not distinguish between abstract simplicial complex and a geometrical <laughs> realization. I somehow work with abstract simplicial complex, but then I draw a picture and it becomes geometrical, so I would pay more much attention to the difference. So, so if, if, if your k is a sphere triangulation like this one, then actually that k is a manifold of, of that dimension, n plus n. So like in that, for, for if, if k was of that form, then it is a sphere triangulation, and we knew that from the beginning, that it was a manifold. But let me warn you that there are many sphere triangulations which, which are not of that form. In dimension 2, that cannot happen. If, if p is, if, if k, if, if that, that n minus 1 is 2, then every triangulation of a two-dimensional sphere comes from a convex polytope, convex inflational polytope. But that fails already in dimension 3. And in general, there are much more sphere triangulations which are not polytopal than those which are polytopal, actually. That's like a, another surprise from higher dimensions. OK, so then, then it's a manifold. OK, that is not many such key not of the form, are not, are not of the form. Okay, now the next piece of picture would be coordinates of space arrangements. That's somehow we are sort of converging to and the mainstream of that workshop, symplectic toric topology. <laughs> so the third one would be complex on M, <coughs> on M vertices, we can set and look at the following subset in M dimensional complex space, U of K equals CM. So we throw away from CM coordinate subspaces, those obtained by setting some coordinates to zero, and for those sets of indices which are not in K, okay, in big K. So again, well, that's an object that's quite familiar to many of you, but I'll still give some examples. Well, but basically those two examples. Uh, I'll reiterate them. The structure. So if this one, if you have this one, then we'll say that that is. So if this is a boundary of a simplex, then we have only one subset which is not a simplex. It's a full set of M indices. The full set of M indices is not a simplex. So we have to throw the corresponding coordinate subset away, coordinate subspace away, and the corresponding coordinate subspace is just zero. <coughs> so that's CM without zero. And second, if K is M points, then U of K is CM. And now we have now the non simplices non simplices are all subsets of cardinality more than one. So, but it's enough just to throw away those corresponding to set subsets of cardinality two. So those coordinate planes of co-dimension two, then the others will be thrown away automatically. So that's equals to. CM without all uh, co dimension to coordinate subspaces. OK. 
Okay. Cm without all co-dimension to coordinate subspaces. And well, you have an easy proposition. But actually, every complement to a set of coordinates subspaces CM. So if you take arbitrary set of coordinate subspace in CM and throw them away, by coordinate I mean of that form, right? Or you can think of just taking basis vectors and spanning the coordinate subspace. If you throw away some set of those coordinate subspace, then you get some subset, then you can always write that subset in that form. It corresponds to some simple shell <coughs> complex. That's an easy combinatorial exercise. As and now we have theorem. There, which links that to the previous. Actually, that that u of k is yet another model for the moment angle complex, but I mean that's not compact unlike all the other spaces which appeared previously. So that's only a model equivalence. So in fact, says that. Moreover, there is not just a homotopy equivalence; there is a deformation retraction. Sometimes it's called strong deformation. So that's so that that k sits inside u of k. That's very easy to check. That that k sits inside u of k, and then u of k projects onto that k, and that so that the <coughs> all maps here are homotopy equivalence, and that k remains stable. Well, I will not prove that. I'll just give you some idea of how how to, you can get a weaker weaker. Uh, if you just you don't if you don't want a retraction, you just want a homotopy equivalence, and then you can proceed the way the following way. So so you write u of k. So you, we wrote z of k as a union of some blocks corresponding to simplices, and you can write u of k. Also, by the similar union of blocks, that's 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 familiar to toric geometries because that space appears often in toric geometry. Uh, we'll get to that later. So you take the product of C in the positions corresponding to indices in sigma, and then product of C star C without zero in other positions, and you take the union of all these things over K, right? And that. You, you, you can observe that this is the same as u of k. And now this is homotopy equivalent. Well, that 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 still requires some 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 arguments, but somehow in here in that union you can you can replace. You cannot always do do it like that. You, in, in such a union, you cannot always replace things by homotopy equivalent ones, so that the whole union becomes homotopy equivalent. But in that case, you can. So you, you replace this one by a homotopy equivalent space, which is just d2 to the sigma. And you replace this one by a homotopy equivalent space, which is uh, uh, s1 to m minus sigma. Right? And that's, by definition, that's that k. So that's how you can get a homotopy equivalence. It doesn't get your attraction, because you cannot retract c on d2 so that this retracts on this one. But some other thing you can get a retraction as well. So example, if k equals this one, so then u of k is cm without zero as we saw, and that of k is s 2m minus 1. So this retracts onto that. That's, that's easy. I mean, if you take the other examples, this one, then you can also say that this thing retracts onto this one, 
that gets give you some idea of how this space may look like, but doesn't tell you much. I still don't mm -hmm. understand what's this. That's logical. Okay. <coughs> now, now the the last subject for this would be a short, like a overview of the relationship with symplectic and toric geometry. Let's, let, I'll put two legs, or I'll clean two legs for here. I, I hope you have this definition. <laughs> okay. So, so let's let's call that as a like a level. That's a, yet another interpretation for that P, and it's like a level set for a moment map. You have a simplicial complex, and you define moment and the complex. So you can define in a basic Siena scale, which is where you today. By that method, you can generalize it by using basic Siena scale. Yes, yes, you, Denis Januszkiewicz also defines that K for arbitrary K. Yeah, but what about but this, uh, the first construction? Uh, when you this quadratic uh, intercept. Uh, that's, 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 that quadratic yeah. presentation really requires some geometry, not just mm -hmm. combinatorics. It requires convex structure on P. I mean, when, maybe you can yeah, do yeah, something yeah, like yeah, that with, yeah, with yeah. not quadratic equations of higher yeah, yeah, degree, but I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah, some uh, algebraic variety you can yes, express it. Yes, yes. Perhaps you can still write it as some real algebraic variety mm -hmm. in some cases, but I don't know. Well, that, that, if you can do that, would be good. I, I, I'm thinking about that, but I mean, mm -hmm. so far. Even for the uh, cases where this uh, is a triangulation of us here? Even for those cases, yes. So far, you can do only polytops. I mean, for those cases, for other trade relations, you can't do. You cannot do. So let's let's so let that let we'll kind of establish briefly a bridge into symplectic and toric geometries. So in the symplectic case, that both of them will be mo much more restricted than the setup which we which we had before, right? So in symplectic case, we start with a Delzan polytope. Which, by definition, means that if you write p like we did many times with inequalities, then the, the Delzant condition means the following two things: first, that a i is a primitive integral vectors, <coughs> and so not, in general they are just real vectors in, in real in real space, but in Delzant that just you, you require them to be integral. And also at every vertex v equals f one f i one f i n, the set the set of the corresponding a normal vectors to those space classes is the basis of the integral lattice. Okay, that's the Delzant condition. Um, then, I mean, since those vectors are integral, you can think of that map. Now we, we wrote it like a p equals like a one through a m. That was an m times n matrix. Now we were always thinking of that as a as a linear map of real vector space. But now since they are integral, we can think of them as a map of integral lattices. So that's our a p now. It's now a map of integral lattices. And we com complete it to a short exact sequence. That's exactly the same sort of C we chosen, we've chosen before. But now everything can be chosen integrally. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that's okay. That's, 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 that's probably, in, in general, that's, that's, that might be not true. I mean, because, yeah, okay, Let, let's, let's just. You can complete that to an inch, uh, to a, to a, but that, that matrix. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In 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 the Delzant. Yeah. Under the, the Delzant condition, you you can. Yeah, but you can you just, that's that is not that map is not a C. But C is not uniquely defi defined, right? Yeah, I mean, you see what's. Uh, 
was uh, C times uh, AP is, is zero. Yes. And that's so that's uh, AP times C is zero. Uh, oh, yes, yes, because that's not easy. That's <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. That, that was oh. a source, source of my con confusion. Yes, yes. That's transpose. Transpose. Transpose, yes. So, uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, hmm. so, uh, so, yeah, because this is, well, we, we wrote like AP, before we wrote AP like a map from R M to R M, right? So that's a linear part of IP. And now that's a transpose conjugate. Right. Right. <coughs> so now that doesn't matter so far, I mean. So now we can write H. Now this is a map of integral lattices, so it also induces a map of tori, which we denote by the same letter. And because of that condition that some some and on top of that is in the, in the basis of an integral lattice. Here you don't have. Uh, uh, here you have uh, the, the, this this subgroup is actually isomorphic to an m minus n dimensional torus. Right. So A P star. Well, you can think of A P star as either a map of integral lattice or a map of tori. That's interchangeable data. The tori by by tori the, the relationship between that lattice and that tori is that. This is a lattice of one parameter subgroups in that torus. Well, I think I need to make a break here. <laughs> it's maybe not the best point, but <laughs> I'd rather not go over the path all the time. <laughs> um, after the next talk, I 